The hidden genius of Realtree is a lot more complicated than you might assume. To understand why Realtree is so successful, you have to imagine not that a company created a product, but that they created a color and that they focused on the licensing of that color to other companies instead of creating their own products. Now, I know the camouflage isn't a color, but it's a compilation of colors and designs, and they were the first ones to popularize this very realistic camouflage pattern. And they kind of ran with it. And instead of producing their own products or having their own factory, they focused on the licensing of this camouflage design to other companies. And it's made them extremely successful and very popular. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get into the hidden genius behind Realtree, let's talk about the origins of camouflage. Now, just because we're talking about Realtree, I did want to cover the origins of camouflage. It is such a funny story if you look into the history of it. So basically, this guy, Lucien Victor Garan de Scavola, probably butchered that. But in 1914, he came up with the concept of camouflage, and they would basically apply it right before they went out. It wasn't like they had a bunch of pre-made uniforms. It was almost like graffiti. You know, they say that the word camouflage comes from the French verb to make up for the stage. So, you know, they were literally making it up. They were painting it onto the clothing right before they were going out into warfare. And you're probably asking yourself what motivated France to be the first to come up with camouflage patterns. And honestly, it's very funny. And uh, I'm going to show you in the next slide exactly why they were the first ones to do it. So it's 1914. It's the beginning of World War I. And France's uniform is blue and red. And it's been this way basically throughout history. Uh, and if you're wondering why it stayed this way, it was because political... You know, people in France at that time were pushing this nationalist ideology that they wanted to, you know, keep the national colors of France in their uniforms the same way it had been throughout their entire history. And I can see, you know, why there would be a lot of pride in that. But obviously, looking back on it, it was a very poor decision, considering how much blue and red would stand out in the battlefield. Now, at some point, they had realized that this was a bad idea and they wanted to do a tricolor pattern in their uniform. So tricolor kind of created a gray look. If you look on the right side of the screen, you can see what tricolor actually is. Uh, ironically enough, this is basically what Germany's colors were. But uh, what ended up happening at the beginning of the war is that the red they had used in the threading was produced. The dye for the red was produced in Germany, and obviously they were fighting a war against Germany, which means they no longer had access to red dye, which led to them only having gray and blue threads. The result of just gray and blue threading in a military uniform, well, let me just show you. So it's 1915, there is no more red dye in France, and you're left with the horizon blue uniform. So this is just made with gray and blue threading, and as you can see, definitely not as concealing as the tricolor, which was the original goal, but since they didn't have the red, this is what they were left with. And wow, I mean, I just, I, I guess it's called horizon blue because the uniforms blended in with the horizon, but obviously... We're not fighting in the sky. We're fighting on the ground. I guess at this point, they might have not been familiar with the fact that a lot of World War I was going to be trench warfare, as you're seeing in this picture. I mean, they stick out like sore thumbs, you know, like nothing of their environment blends in with their uniform at all. So just a, a disaster. And I'm pretty sure they paid for this a lot. You know, it was a combination of a lot of bad moves by France. Obviously, first one being the color of the uniform. Second one being the fact that they were going in with these huge guns into trenches. And, you know, long guns for trench warfare, it's very hard to aim your gun and to turn it around and just to have good movement. So uh, just a lot of bad planning going into World War One by the French. And uh, obviously, this is, this is what inspired the concept of camouflage because when you stick out so badly like this, you're going to be the first people to think about how do we conceal ourselves better. So I saw these pictures in a Business Insider article and I thought I would add them because it just shows the development of the U.S. uniform throughout the years. And obviously you can see that they caught on a little quicker than France did. So in 1914, they've got full khaki uniforms. And even if you go as far back as 1898, they're still using khaki, which obviously blends in a lot better to the ground compared to a color like sky blue. So, you know, pause the video if you want to take a look at the development. Again, this is a Business Insider article. Uh, the authors were Dylan Roach and Jeremy. Bender. I don't know which one did the drawings, but they're very good and just kind of shows you how camouflage developed over the years in the U.S. military's uh, uniforms. Uh, also, something I wanted to mention is that there's a couple of different camouflage patterns I'm not going to mention in these next slides. Uh, one of them is tiger stripe. I know that a lot of people use them in the military, but I don't think the U.S. military actually ever issued tiger stripe. I'm pretty sure that people actually had to add it onto their uniforms themselves. So let's take a look at some of the really popular 
uh, patterns that the military is actually using right now throughout the world. So this is different militaries from different countries. And I'll tell you where they come from, but just take a look at this. So these are some of the popular camouflages you're going to see on Reddit. Uh, a lot of tactical enthusiasts are going to talk about these camouflages. You've got Flectarn, which Germany still uses to this day. It was originally created in 1976, and it's been active from 1990 until now. Uh, U.S. Woodland is a very, very popular camouflage used by the U.S. military. It was created in 1976, and it was active from 1981 until now. It's still active now, but it's getting phased out, and it's not very popular. It was very popular back in the day because it was part of the battle dress unit form, which the U.S. used, but uh, it's getting phased out now for more modern military camouflages like the Canadian CAD pad. That's the Canadian disruptive pattern. Uh, it was created in 1995, and it's been active from 1997, and it's still active today. And it uses that digital pattern, which you know you wouldn't see in nature, but it's very easy to stitch together. And uh, yeah, it works very well. You know, uh, a lot of research went into it and the, it was found that it worked very well in woodland conditions, very good camouflage, so good that the U.S. Marines copied it and it was copied and uh, originally created in 2001 and they started using it in 2002. Marines still use it and some other U.S. military groups use it to the present day. That's the MARPAT. And then uh, if you want to talk about a U.S. camo disaster, take a look at this. So here you've got the U.S. Universal Camouflage Pattern. It was created in 2004, and they started using it in 2005. You can see it's a copy of the Marpat Digital Camo, which is a copy of the CADPAT Canadian Digital Camouflage. So uh, obviously they had to keep changing it. I believe the reason that the U.S. Army changed it was because they didn't want to pay the Marines for the Marpat design. So you ended up with this. And the problem with this design is that not a lot of research went into it. So it turns out that it didn't work really good in uh, against shading, like shadows. It didn't look very well in like, you know, just didn't, didn't work as good camouflage essentially. Also, there wasn't that wide of a color spectrum in this camouflage, which meant from a distance, it could appear very solid, which is the opposite of what camouflage is supposed to do. So due to the fact that the universal camouflage was shit, they changed it to the operational camouflage pattern. Uh, it was created in 2002. Then they revised the design in 2009 and they started actively implementing it in U.S. uniforms in 2015. Now, from what I've read online, this is the main camouflage that the U.S. military uses today. Now, it's very important to talk about Jim Crumley because he's like the true OG of realistic hunting camouflage. So he created his tree bark pattern in, 19, in somewhere in the 1970s, and then he started production in 1980. So on the right, you have his pattern on a jacket, and you can see it's got those real shapes that you would see in a woodland environment. You know, it kind of looks like sticks and wood, and that's something that you don't see on military uniforms for the main reason being that military uniforms need to work on a wide variety of different environments. You never know where a, a war is going to take place, where a military conflict is going to happen. So you can't have a camouflage that's meant for something very specific, which is what Jim Crowley was going for. You know, he wanted a, a camouflage that was going to work specifically for the hunting environment that he was in. So for that reason, you end up with this very specific pattern. And it makes sense that the US and other, you know, uh, militaries across the world don't use these specific patterns because they need something that's a little bit more general. But for hunting in specific environments, this was perfect. And we just got to give credit to Jim Crumley because he's the true OG. He came before Realtree and anybody else came up with hyper-realistic camouflage. It was Jim. He was the first guy. So here you got Bill Jordan on the far left, and he's the founder of Realtree, which he created in 1986. Not to say there wasn't any competition out there. Moss Yoke, another very popular camouflage company, was also created in the mid-80s. But we're not going to focus on them today. We're going to talk about Bill. So this is from the Realtree website. Bill had entered the hunting industry in 1983 when he started Spartan Archery Products in a back room of his father's boat dealership in Columbus, Georgia. And that is how Bill came to be sitting in his parents' front yard one day in 1986 with paper and colored pencils, sketching and coloring the bark of a giant oak tree that grew there. Bill believed that by layering the images of twigs and leaves over a vertical bark background, he could, he could create a three-dimensional appearance that would match a variety of terrain and make his pattern distinct. And that was very true. It did make his pattern distinct. And you can see in one of his Spartan catalogs on the right, this is kind of the blueprint, the OG pattern that Bill Jordan had created for Realtree. And at this point, this is basically the only concept he had because the other products that he had created with the Realtree pattern, the camouflage would just rub off. At this point, he had not perfected a way to create the Realtree camouflage on actual fabric. So this is basically the only prototype he had the one that's on that Spartan, uh, the Spartan catalog from 1987. 
This is where the real genius of Realtree starts to show. So it's 1987 and Bill only has photos of his products due to the production issues I was talking about before, right? So the camouflage design was actually rubbing off the fabric, but he's still building up interest through the photos he has. And eventually he decides that he's going to do a physical show at the Las Vegas SHOT Show. And this is in 1987. So he orders fabric from the one company he found that can actually keep it onto the fabric and he orders it and it goes to the wrong Columbus. It goes to Columbus, Ohio instead of Columbus, Georgia. And this leads to him only having the fabric in hand three days before the show. So he runs to the manufacturer and he creates some samples for uh, the SHOT Show. He only has a few samples because he's broke and he only has a little bit of fabric and he only had three days to create the samples. But within 30 minutes of being at the SHOT Show, Walmart and Bass Pro are already super interested, right? So both companies start asking what his level of production is and they've quickly realized that Bill is broke and he has no level of production. But this leads to the genius, the genius that is licensing. And we're going to talk about that right now through a diagram. So what you're looking at here is a diagram of the original licensing agreement that was made that very day at that SHOT Show in 1987, right? So here you've got Bill, right? And the green lines are the people that are paying Bill, right? So first, let's talk about East Bank Textiles. Now, this is the company that he found that can actually produce his camouflage design onto fabric, right? So East Bank Textiles is paying Bill for the right, for the licensing to produce his camouflage pattern onto fabric. Then Walmart and Bass Pro are both paying East Bank Textiles for that fabric so that they can turn it into products. And then Walmart and Bass Pro are both paying Bill for the licensing to use their camouflage in their products, right? So you've got East Bank Textiles, Walmart, and Bass Pro all paying Bill in this diagram with zero upfront costs for Bill. And not to say that Bill doesn't put money into advertising Realtree, but he doesn't need to, right? Based off this business model, there is zero upfront cost for Bill. And if you look at a current day diagram that I made, and this is just a fraction of some of the collaborations that Bill has done recently through Realtree, but you've got Benelli, which makes, you know, rifles and shotguns, Bass Pro, Supreme, Walmart, Moose Knuckle, Spider, which is a streetwear brand, New Balance, Nike, which is used the multiple times, Carhartt, ASRV, another streetwear brand. All these guys have had to get licensing from Bill from Realtree so that they could use Realtree's camouflage in their products. And this is what's made Bill so successful. He's not running a clothing company. He's running a licensing company. And if you Google his net worth, it says it's around 10 million. And I have a feeling that it's probably a lot higher than that. But still, 10 million is a very successful company and a very successful individual, right? You know, and this is all from licensing a camouflage pattern, right? Something that you could, you know, say is almost like licensing a color, right? He hasn't had to do any of the production for any of the products that Benelli, Bass Pro, Supreme, Walmart, Moose Knuckle, Spider, New Balance, Nike, Carhartt, ASRV, Crocs, Waffle House. They, he hasn't had to pay for any of it. And that's the beauty of this business model, right? He just has to focus on putting a little bit of money towards advertising his Realtree camouflage brand to make sure it maintains itself as the most popular camouflage design. And the rest is done by itself. If these companies want to use the most trendy camouflage design in their products, they have have to use Realtree because it's the most popular, which means they're paying for licensing fees from Bill. And that's it. That's how Realtree's business model is genius. You know, they're not a clothing company. They're a licensing company and they're fucking good at it. And I had a lot of fun making this video. It was really cool to do research on camouflage. It makes a lot of sense that a French person would be the first person to come up with camouflage considering the fact that they were out there in World War One in the fucking trenches in sky blue uniforms. That shit blew my mind. That's just so funny to me. And yeah, if you guys want me to do more videos like this, please subscribe. Put some suggestions in the comments. Uh, it's really fun to make videos like this. I'm basically just, you know, talking about stuff that I'm interested in. So if that's what you guys like to see from me, I'll keep doing it and uh, make sure to drink water and to have a great day. I'm outie.